our evening service. Please um, grab a hymn book and everybody stand with me and turn to number 16. We're going to start with number 16. Whoa. And we'll do verses 1 and 2 of number 16. to number 514 and we'll do one three and four Good to see you here this evening. Let's pray. Father, it is awesome that we can sing about what the future is going to hold, what it's going to look like. Lord, it's just uh, amazing. We thank you for being our kinsman redeemer, our Goel, and our avenger of blood. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us, for going to that cross and dying for us. And Lord, we just thank you that we can come together here this afternoon and sing and praise you and worship you. Lord, we thank you for loving us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen seated. Who has a guest they'd like to introduce?
You said that in that tone of voice? <laughs> Welcome, Maddie. We're glad you're here. Amen. Honestly, that's the only visitor I think we have. I was totally setting him up. Are there others? All right. Does anyone have a testimony they'd like to share? Something God has done? Annie, you got to stand. You know the rules. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And mom, for those who don't know, mom's starting where in this journey? Where is she? So I'm originally from El Salvador. So mom and dad are still there, but after sister is there, she will take care of the school. So that's where they're starting, but up to DC and down to Charlotte. Amen. Well, we'd love to be a part of helping if we can in some way. Amen. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else? Okay, just a reminder of a couple things. First of all, don't forget these business cards up here. They have a place on the back for your name and your phone number. Then you just give them to someone. Say, why don't you meet me at church? Some of you feel a little weird about pulling those big tracks out of your pocket. I understand. This is something smaller. You can leave these when you tip. When you tip very well. When you, when you don't tip very well, leave some other church's stuff. And uh, Tabernacle or Lakeview or Springs Road or something like that. What? Did I say that out loud? All right, so uh, that's that. Uh, I'd like to read a verse for you that's going to come up tonight in Proverbs. Don't, you don't need to turn to it. I just want to read it to you. It's, I just want you to hear it and enjoy it with me. It's Proverbs 10, 12. Listen to this verse. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Amen. We have table talk for you if you need it. Make sure you grab one on your way out for our dinner table <laughs> conversations. We're going to remain seated for our last song. What number is it? 516, 516, and we'll do one and three. You have your Bibles turn to first Peter chapter 4 reading verses 1 through 11 in the pew Bible that's 1489 and the way I know that is 
I bought this Bible and it matches the Pew Bible exactly. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, Lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abomination idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they may also that they, that they may also be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things have favorite love for one another, for lo love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good shepherds of the manifold grace of God, or stewards of the manifold first, the grace of God, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Yes. Well, it's uh, great to be with you in 1 Peter chapter number 4, and if you were in the adult class during VBS, you heard the first two chapters again, and now we're in chapter 3 and 4. We have two messages left, or two, might call them lessons left in this book tonight and next week, Lord willing. And if the Lord is willing, we will do this or that, to quote James 4. And so here we are. And if you're wondering, when did we cover 318 to 46? Well, it's full of good stuff, and we covered that in March of 2018 on a Sunday night. So no doubt you remember that. Um, but in case you have questions about that, then I would ask you to bring them up, and we can talk about that. Incidentally, I hope that you were paying attention when the brother read it. 46, the gospel was preached to those who are dead. When did that happen? So I hope you're interested and your interest is peaked a little bit in that. But tonight we're going to focus on verses 7 through 11. Next week, God willing, 12 through 19. And that will be it because last summer we covered chapter 5. And, um, and so that's that. Then we're going to go on to something different. This Wednesday we're going to be in uh, the book of Ezra, chapter 4. We're going to talk about what to do when you don't have permission to do what you think you ought to do. That'll be this Wednesday night. It's always open forum. We always talk, ask questions, and make comments <clears throat> on Wednesday night because there's a few less of us. Usually there's about 90 to 100 of us on Wednesday nights, and so we can talk more. And we have usually about 25 minutes after our prayer time. So I hope that some of you who've never been there before will check it out. So, I don't know, a little check here on our second hymn that we sang, When We All Get to Heaven. A little, let's see if you, how, how good your recall is of the book of Revelation. How many gates, soon the pearly gates will open, how many gates are there in the New Jerusalem? That's right, 12. For the brave soul that said four, you're mostly right. You just need to multiply it by three in your home, all right? <laughs> And then it said, we'll tread the streets of gold. How many streets of gold are there in the New Jerusalem? One. So should we just not sing it again? No. For those of you who are conscience-driven to only sing biblical truth, you're allowed to sing that in the singular the next time that we sing that hymn. We'll tread the street of gold. Okay. And that might make you feel a little better about that. All right. That's obviously very important. So here we are, verses 7 through 11, and I have uh, about eight things I want to talk to you about tonight. We're going to go to the next slide just as soon as you flip it, all right? Verse number 7, the end of all things is at hand, so be serious and watchful in your prayers. You might be wondering, what are the all things, or what is the end of all things that is at hand? Well, it says in verse number 5, 
that there's a certain amount of people, both living and dead, who will give an account to him who is ready. Can we go to the, yep, very good, thank you. See, it's still the first one up there, so I was tricked. Okay, thank you very much. And so you have, um, you have him saying that the end of all things is at hand. That means it's right here. Now, Peter says everything's about to close up. We're about done. We're talking right here on this top one. That word eschatology is a big word. But if you have been studying your Bible, which I know that many of you have for years and years, that's a word you need to get used to because it comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last. And it means basically the study of last times. Some people call it prophecy. Eschatology is another word for it. Notice what Peter says in verse number seven. The end of all things is at hand. Now, the reason why this is interesting to us, and I'm keeping a track of time because we have less time on business meeting nights than we normally do. The reason I want you to see this is because Peter has been promised that he's going to die an old man. Hasn't he? Where would I look to find that? John, the last chapter of John. He was told the time is coming when you're going to be carried about like an old man. And basically, he was promised his hands would be stretched forth. The idea was that he was promised a crucifixion. Church tradition tells us that he was probably crucified upside down. Anyways, he was probably killed in his 60s or 70s. In 1 Peter, he is potentially in his 60s. So he feels like the end is quickly coming. Now, the math is pretty simple. 60s AD, we're suspecting that he is maybe the age of Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. Jesus leaves planet earth at the age of 33, somewhere probably around 30 AD. So if Peter is Jesus's age, he might be a few years less, then that makes him about 60 in the year 62 or 63. So he is an older man. Back in the day, they didn't live to be 79 all the time. That wasn't the average life expectancy like it is in good old America. But there, 60s, kind of, kind of up there. And so he is ready, and he knows he's been promised the death. So what you should get from this is that you can both feel like you're going to die before the Lord returns and expect the Lord to return. Let me show you this again. Hold your place here. Look at the next book. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 1. Look at 2 Peter chapter number 1. So I want you to like, get used as a Christian. I want you to get used to holding two things in tension. Like hold both truths that are difficult. Last week, last Sunday morning, we talked about how we neither want to presume nor procrastinate. Here I'm telling you to be ready to live long and die as an old man or woman and live as though you have no time left whatsoever. Both. Second Peter chapter number one, you'll notice in verse number 12, look what Peter says in a second epistle, second letter. He says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, look what he says. I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. What does he mean when he says, my tent, my body? He says, I got a me that you don't see, and it's living in this tent. And he says, soon, I'm going to put off this tent. It'll just be me. And to quote Psalm 48, I'm going to fly away. So if that's true, Psalm 90, Psalm 90. So if that's true, Psalm 48 is a different one, obviously. Uh, if it's true, then somehow Peter says, I'm really close to death, but I'm going to stay faithful in what God's given me to do, even though I'm old enough to die. And what is the truth? Well, you look at 2 Peter 3, notice there, please, in 2 Peter 3, that he deals with people in verse 3, now we're in 2 Peter 3, 3, he says there's going to be scoffers, knowing this first, scoffers will come in the last days. Verse number four, they're going to be saying, where's the promise of his coming? So Peter, if he were here tonight, he would look at my older brothers and sisters in Christ in this room, and he would say, don't assume that you're going to live until you die of natural causes. Assume you'll be faithful till then. Don't assume you're going to live till then. But assume that the Lord is real close Real close. How close? So close, according to our passage tonight, that he's at 
hand. 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. So he says, be, we're in 1 Peter 4, 7, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. The second thing I want you to see is how we have been for three months now doing James in the morning, 1 Peter at night, 1 John on Wednesday. I want you to remember, and just write right next to this verse if you'd like, how serious the Lord's return is to all three of these guys. And they wrote in three different decades. All right, so here's the verses you can write down. James 5, verse 7, 8, and 9. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. The husbandman that waits for the long fruit of the earth has long patience for it until he has received the early and the latter rain. Be you also patient, for the coming of the Lord draws nigh. That's James 5, 7, and 8. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may be assured before him at his coming. Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it doesn't know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So you have James 5, you have 1 John 2, 28 through chapter 3, verse 3, you have 1 Peter. James is written late 40s, Peter is written early, mid 60s, 1 John is written in the 80s. What should that tell you? 40 years of church history has not changed their view that they should be ready to die like old men and not live long enough to become old men. We're gonna hold both of those truths. That's the difference between procrastination and, and presuming or presumption. Any questions on that? Easy crowd. All right. Let's talk about the third thing. The secret life that fuels the public life. We're in 1 Peter chapter 4. You're looking at the end of verse 7. Why do we want in all things? Now listen to this. This is good. You might remember from what Ronnie read that we want to cease from sinning in chapter four, verse one. You might notice in verse number two, it's possible for somebody to get to where they no longer live the rest of their time in the flesh for the lust of men. Now, if you wanna know how that's possible, and it's a scary verse, I, if you're paying attention, you might notice that at the end of verse one, the one who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Show me something, show me somebody that is in the act of suffering rightly for Jesus Christ, and I'll show you someone that in that moment has for at least a window ceased from sinning. So, we should not satisfy ourselves with a life of sin, merely saying things like, I'm only human, or I'm a sinner saved by grace, what do you expect? Or, he's still working on me. Things that we've heard said that let people off the hook for being awful Christians, terrible human beings. We should not let ourselves off the hook. There is a possibility that if we rightly suffer, then we will actually for a little while know a life that is relatively free from sinning. Think about 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I write these things unto you that you do not sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We're actually commanded to live a life free of sinning. But if we don't do it, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So what kind of sin should we be known as being people that are free from? Notice verse, what sin should we be free from? Verse three, we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles, the nations, the ethnos, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. And if you have an old King James in the room, you got a couple words in there that are even a little bit, you, makes you want to kind of suck air a little bit. 
You don't want to say I'm even a mixed company anymore. It's kind of like the word for donkey. You're like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not sure I'm supposed to say that anymore, even though it's in the Bible. And here you see that that kind of stuff is supposed to be behind us as Christians. We're supposed to be people that don't say, well, you know, I love Jesus. I just have a problem swearing. We're supposed to be people that say, I used to have a problem swearing. And what we're supposed to be seeing here in this book filled with suffering is that if you want to be someone who's trying to get over that little pet sin, is just suffer for Christ a little bit. Now, I've told you in many weeks successively, I need this probably as much as anyone in the room because I have the tendency to justify why I feel and do what I do. Am I alone? It turns out that there's a several of us in here. The rest of you, please go to ministerial school ASAP. <laughs> Soon. Because no saint should be without a pulpit. Anyways, here we have, at the end of verse number seven, he says, therefore. So this Christ, who's gonna judge the living and the dead in verse five, verse number seven, therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. You know, I would think that he would say something else. Maybe there's other things we can do to be ready for the coming of Christ. Maybe there's other things we can do. Like, um, clean up our lives. Stop smoking. Stop swearing. Stop gawking at people you're not married to. Stop cheating on your taxes. Stop speeding in the, on the highway. Just stop it. To quote Bob Newhart, the great theologian. Just stop it. Maybe that's what we should do when we know the Lord is coming upon us. But that's not what he says. End of verse 7. Be, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Apparently, the best way for us to be ready for the end of all things is for us to have a hot heart of prayer, somehow. Let me see if I can demonstrate this just a little bit. This is the underbelly of a diesel submarine in Pearl Harbor called the Bowfin. In 2008, my wife and I and our kids toured this, and I was always enamored by the fact that it's a diesel submarine. Now, I know a little something about engines. That's what I did in the Army my first nine years mostly, I worked on 9,000 cubic inch engines, V16s, that turn big power plants. So I have a great deal of appreciation for diesel technology and electrical theory. I love it. This had me wondering, though, because usually when you have an engine, you have something that has got to get rid of the waste products from the engine. It's called an exhaust pipe. And I was kind of wondering how that works in a submarine. When you go underwater, how does that work? Have you just got this constant pressure that is more than the pressure of water to get in that tailpipe? Or is there something else? Turns out that below this floor in the picture, there are, I think, nearly 100 batteries. So when they're on the surface, the diesel engine charges the batteries. And then when they have to go below the surface, they turn off the diesel engine. And they go below water and run completely on battery. I was, I, I have, I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I watch Mega Movers. It is a series of just phenomenal things. And one time, they were doing this um, 36 axle, 36 axle trailer that was carrying a several ton engine and generator, and they cut the belly open on this cruise ship on the hull. They, they had welders that cut a hole in it and they had this, it took forever to get that thing up there. Just this hydraulic monster putting this big engine up next to where they put this hole. And they're just going to slide it on in there. No big deal. And then these amazing welders. Tim, can you weld a ship hull? Probably could. <laughs> Let's start with a John boat. And, and I want, I at least know I can swim in Lake Hickory. So after they put... They put this big gen set in the belly of this cruise ship, and then they welded that, that piece of whatever steel back onto the hull like they were never there. And you know, I thought it was interesting. Nikki and I went on a cruise one time, 2015. I had a church member in Fayetteville say, preacher, I need to talk to you. I said, oh, what have I done now? All right, sure, let's, let's talk. And so we sit down at Cracker Barrel, and he's got his laptop computer, and you know, Usually that's not how people want to speak to me. Uh, maybe biscuits, but not a computer and biscuits. And so he says, I got a problem. I said, well, I'm here to help if I can. 
He says, well, my wife and I were part of, uh, you know, vacation club, and we've had a lot of deaths in the family, so we can neither go on our timeshare nor go on our cruise, and we need you to go on our cruise. I said, ah, very well. I think <laughs> I'm your guy. I can help. I can help here. And, you know, it's interesting. We never saw the engine room, but we would have known for sure if it wasn't working. Yes. We enjoyed, uh, what's that fellow that for the funny hair that dies, uh, Divin, uh, drives, divins, drivins, dives, and yeah. diners. Yeah, you could eat any of his hamburgers around the clock and soft serve 24 hours a day. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> At some point, if the engine room isn't working, the soft serve stops. Right. The lights go out. The AC, I don't care how many pterodactyls they make out of my towels. I need power. You know what I'm saying? Pterodactyls are those prehistoric, oh, all right. You said you didn't know what you was talking about, if you believe in prehistory. You always know if the engine room is not working, and the Christian is soon going to know that they're not ready for the coming of Christ if they're not praying. Somehow, we have gotten to the idea that we can make ourselves better by simply behaving more. Um, it reminds me how important the secret life of a believer is. And while not replacing the outward expression of the secret life, like don't take part in drunken parties, verse 3, Peter's solution is not stop drinking. He expects that people that spend time in prayer will have a cleaned up life where they drink less, for example. You know, showing up to parties where you should not be. I know this is a conversation. People are like, well, you know, I go there to witness. Come on, friends. This is obviously not the context, and I'll bet you, you can witness better if they're sober. And it turns out here that the solution for wanting to be in the same places is a good, steady, serious, watchful prayer life. So here's the problem with us, though. We don't make the preacher, mm, be careful, Pastor Bill. We usually don't think that our private lives are the problem. Like, if I have a marriage issue, I don't usually think that it's my prayer life that's a problem. I usually think it's my wife that's the problem. And if you think that's not true, just look, for me, it's one column over. Chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I mean, look how, look how Peter connects outward conduct with a prayer life in both 3-7 and 4-7. And so usually when people leave our church, they don't say, Pastor Bill, I'm carnal. I have a real problem with my devotion life. No, usually, and I have a fresh example of it, I'm the scapegoat. N no one leaves the church, it seems, and says, I've got major problems with my spirituality and I need to meet with you. It's usually too late by then because it's far more natural to assume that when I have conflict with a brother or sister in Christ, it's not my prayer life that needs the work, it's their conduct. Here, we guard our prayer lives and our heart or we will soon begin to guard our pride and blame other people. We'll pull the whole curly of the Three Stooges thing. I'm merely a victim of circumstance. And my prayer is that we will be a really well-known church for our prayer lives, not for how well we fight. I don't think we're known as a fighting church, and I want to keep it that way. I hear good things about our church. I want to keep it that way. I don't know very many couples in our church that divorce while they're here. Usually they have to leave the church and then they have space to leave their spouses. That is a good sign that there's a culture here of faithfulness and loyalty. That's beautiful. This is not a cult. There is a possibility that I'm gonna get some things wrong and I hope that you'll help me to get them right. This is not a cult. We don't have a dude at the top and everyone else just kind of does what he says. This is not that. But my prayer is 
that before we decide the other person is the problem, that we're willing to be fervent in our prayer lives because in this passage, it is the cure for being ready for the end of all things. That's what I want to do. Number next, let's talk about hot warmth. You're like, well, that's crazy. That's dumb. Right. It's, it's silly unless there's a reason I'm saying it. Look at verse number eight. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love is usually characterized by feelings of warmth. Like, like someone told me they brought a blanket tonight. Not, I'm not talking about temperature. I'm talking about when you know you're among people that want God's best for you and that you really feel like they're there for your betterment. Isn't that a great feeling? To know when you're with friends and they don't want to hurt you. That's a beautiful feeling. To know that you're, you're, you don't mean harm to anyone. You might get some things wrong, but people generally want good for you. That is a warm feeling. I think people here would probably say that when you know you're loved, it's one of the best feelings in the whole world. And here, above all things, have fervent love. Peter says, I'm going to say something that doesn't make all kinds of sense by itself. I want you to take the warmth that you feel, and I want you to crank it up to fervent warmth, one for the other. And here's why. Because what we just mentioned in verse number seven matters in verse number eight. That love will cover a multitude of sins. Now we're getting a really good appreciation for what Peter thinks about the Proverbs. Peter is big about the Proverbs. In fact, next Sunday night, if the Lord is willing, we'll notice he quotes a proverb in verse 18. But here, in verse number uh, 8, he is quoting a proverb. Someone give me a really simple take-home from that verse. Simpler than you're thinking. Jesus' love covers our sins. Totally gospel-centered. I love it. What else? All right, here's one. Read the Proverbs. Peter believed the Proverbs. The Proverbs are good for us. And Peter is here quoting the Proverbs. Peter says it doesn't have to be a really deep book. Just pick one in the Old Testament. And you're going to have something that bleeds bibbling to you. Or as Ron pointed out, it's going to show you Christ all over again. Ron got right to the point, though, didn't he? The reason that we want to cover other people's shortcomings, and in some cases their sins, is because that's what Christ did for us. Think of this, Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 3. It is honorable to cease from striving, since any fool can start a quarrel. It is the glory of kings to overlook a matter. See, the Proverbs are replete with opportunities to learn how to get by with typical tickings off that happen to us throughout the, the course of life. And here, we're finding out that this proverb is so good, it shows up again in the book of James, this proverb right here. In James chapter 5 and verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he who converts a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will hide a multitude of sins. Both James and Peter quote this Proverbs chapter 10 and verse number 12. Here we are reminded again that the New Testament authors had a great deal of respect for the Old Testament scripture. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's talk about that word charismatic. What do you think that means? Okay. You can't define an adjective with a noun. What, what is charismatic? What do you think it means? Passionate? All right. Nothing wrong with that. I, I would expect. I'm surprised someone would say it's something like Pentecostal, right? Right? You ever heard of the charismatic movement? All right, let's see where that word comes from. Look at verse number nine. Be hospitable one to another without grumbling. Verse number 10, as each one has received a gift. 
a gift. There's no definite article in the Greek language there, so if you have the gift, no problem, but it's a gift. As each one has received a gift, minister, uh, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. The word behind gift there is the word charisma. Charisma. Now, the shortened form of the word charisma is charis. That is the Greek word for the word grace. Charisma is a grace in the form of a noun, a grace gift, a, a thing of grace. You're given it. So a gift, in verse number 10, is re- remember the word behind it is charisma. The root word is charis, which means grace. So gift and grace are nearly synonymous. Notice, please, what he says each one has received. Everyone in this body tonight who is a Christian has a charisma. Everyone in this, now usually we think charisma is someone who's really good in front of crowds, right? That's something we made up. We have hijacked that word. That's not what it means. Charisma is a gift. It's a grace. And Scripture says in this verse, everyone has received one. We've received a gift, at least one. Now, more to our conversation, in four books in the New Testament, it lists some gifts. You can see over here in 1 Peter, we have two of them listed. You can see in 1 Peter 4, verse 11, you have speaking and you have serving or ministering. You can see that in verse 11. You have over here, you have what we might call helping or ministering. You have exhorting or speaking. Now, what you might notice here is that the gifts are for a particular purpose. Can you please tell me what the immediate purpose is of the gifts that you're given in this verse? To serve others. Everyone else or a particular group of people? The brotherhood one another, the people that are making up these ecclesias. So while it's really inspirational to talk about your gift that the world just needs, just know that that's not the biblical use of that word. The biblical use of the word is you've been given something that the body of Christ needs, and it's supposed to be used there. So it could be that you have a talent. That's not what we're talking about. It could be that you have a skill. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about something that is so unusual that verse 11 says, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Look here. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, and in all things, that in all things God may be glorified. So this is something specific and special that God gives you the ability to perform. What questions do you have about that? Do you know your spiritual gift? Do you know what your charisma is? You have at least one of them. In the months to come, we're going to make everyone nervous with that left column. I hope you're prepared. Because it's just easy to say, oh, those don't exist today. That might make you feel better, but we're going to exegete the text and find out if that's what it says. But we have a list of gifts here, and I dare say that since Peter wasn't exhaustive, and neither was Paul here, and neither was Paul here, that probably he's not exhaustive here either, that these are samples of the many spiritual gifts that you can have, a charisma. So now you know why the charismatic movement is called that, because it is a gifts-focused religion. Okay, what questions do you have now? So ask yourself, What are you doing for the body of Christ? Next question, do you like it? Because if you don't like it, there is a strong chance it's not your gift. Now here it is again. Next Sunday morning, Brother Randy Brannon is going to get up here and he's going to talk before the offering about how we need men who are willing to work on security. Right now we're down to six teams. There is no gift in the New Testament for hold a weapon and make sure people don't hurt the people inside. There are some things we do because we have the energy and the desire to do them, and they are not giftings. 
This is something particular for making the body of Christ more spiritual. That's what we're talking about when we say gifting. I'm not under the impression that working in the nursery is a gift. Being gifted in those areas might make it easier to do so, but that doesn't mean that you have to be gifted in nursery care to serve. I mean, take it like this. Do your children have the gift of flushing the commode? <laughs> but you expect them to do it, don't you? I hope you do. I hope you don't follow them around bathroom to bathroom and flush it for them. Oh, that's not your gift. <laughs> there are certain things we do because we're, we've got to do them. And there are other things we don't have to do and we shouldn't weary ourselves as a body of Christ to make sure they get done. Here's what I'm trying to say. Hear it again. I haven't said it in four months. Here it is again. If you came here because you like the worship, don't leave here because you're under the burden of doing too much. Remember what brought you here. Fervent love from the brothers and good worship. And you might be in seasons where you say, I can help you in that for a week, a month, a half a year, a year. I'll commit to you for that for a year. Some of you are going to come up in August. It's going to be choir time. I don't think that there's a gift of choir singing. Not in the body of Christ. Not necessarily. You might have a skill for singing. But that doesn't mean that's a spiritual gift. Yet you might notice there might be some empty chairs in the choir. Maybe instead of feeling like it's a life sentence, you can say, it's not my gifting. I don't necessarily love it, but I do enjoy worship. Angie, you got me for four months till Christmas. That's how you keep your sanity in the body of Christ. So if you feel like life is piling in on you, you don't cut back on your worship life. You cut back on the stuff that drains you, and you operate in your gifting all the time so that you and the body can be edified. Amen. All right. Now what questions do you have? All right. We're almost out of time. So why do we have these gifts? We see in verse number 10, so that we can minister to one another, but why? Okay, we know the why. Now what's the why behind the why? Why do we minister one to another? My, my outline is shot to smithereens. Don't worry about those eight things. We're getting there. That's right. Dana's got it. Verse 11 if anyone speaks, let them speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let them, I had some nerdy stuff to show you there, but we're just, that's just going to have to wait. Let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God might be glorified. All right. Feeling useful is really a beautiful thing, but that's not the motive for our exercising of our gifts. We want God to be glorified. We want people to think really well of the Lord God. So we want to be useful, and we want to be appreciated, and we want to be affirmed. Those are all worthwhile, understandable human motivations. But in this text, you and I are being challenged to make sure that we locate our spiritual gifting so that everyone else benefits, so that everyone else makes God look good. Makes God look good. Now this is going to create a lot more questions, like should I ever do anything outside my gifting? We've already discussed that. This is going to do a lot of other questions like, well, you know, how, how do I know when I'm in my gifting and how do I ease out of that situation? What if my church doesn't offer something that I feel like I'm gifted in? Good conversation. You know my phone number. It's in public. It's right on the back of the bulletin. Let's talk. Sometimes God brings other people to our church for us to have a greater ministerial outreach to our community that we didn't have before. Sometimes God brings people to our church for a facet of self-care that we didn't have before. There are gaps in the way we care for one another. And sometimes the Lord brings one more person to our body to help fill in those gaps that we don't know that we have. It's a whole lot easier to go that way than to grow disenfranchised and discontented with your church. So if you see a need, that's when we pray. God, bring someone here that has a gift for, and then we fill in the blank. That is one way for us to fill up our prayer list. All right. But notice, please, how God is greatly glorified at the end of verse 11. That he may be glorified through Jesus Christ. One minute left. Here we go. Okay. God is only glorified 
when we operate in our charisma in this context, he is greatly glorified when we operate in our charisma, and he is greatly glorified when we operate in our charisma to each other, specifically when Jesus Christ is given more glory and more dominion. That is the result. God is greatly glorified because Jesus is given greater glory and greater domination. Notice how Notice how related that word domination is to the word dominion. So as we operate in our gifts, people are edified, God is glorified, Christ is exalted. How does that happen? Okay, here it is, big closing, here we go. Here's the discussion of how Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. He died for us, cleansed our consciences, cleaned our hearts, claimed our soul, and put the Holy Spirit in us. And because of that, we have a charisma. And the more that we operate in our gifts, the more the body looks like a functioning body, less limps, less little catches in the neck, so to speak, and Christ is greatly glorified because he gets more glory, more brightness, more domination. How does Jesus take over the world? when you and I exercise our gifts. Now this is wild because our giftedness somehow subdues nations for Christ to have a greater dominion. How does our giftedness exercised with each other give Jesus Christ greater dominion in this earth? Is it through political activism? Maybe, but if it is political activism or military action or community service, then it is through the body of Christ as Christians practice their charisma. And that is the biblical method of Jesus taking over the whole world. Is his body becomes a more integral part of each other. And we hear the Father say in this passage, it's through ministering to members of Jesus Christ's body in the arenas that permeate our world. So are you challenged with Washington right now? Washington needs to see what Christians look like when they serve each other with their gifts. Are you bothered with your workplace right now? Your workplace needs to see Christ take greater control when he sees how two Christians furnish one another with their gifts. That is the biblical way that Jesus Christ will conquer the world when the body of Christ functions greater together. That's what he said in John 13, 35. All men will know you're my disciples because you love one another. So the world needs neat tracks, maybe. Does the world need better apologetics? Possibly. Does it need more TV preachers? Perhaps, but Peter says, <clears throat> if he had one thing to say tonight to Sandy Ridge Baptist Church, he says, Jesus gets more domination of planet Earth when Sandy Ridge Baptist Church starts at home and shows fervent, hot, engine room prayer, fueling, fervent, hot charity one toward the other. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you, in the strong name of Jesus, that you'd help us to live this thing in the power that God supplies according to the passage. I pray that there will be people in this room today who will decide. I don't care if anyone else gives thought to this message, I'm gonna find out what is my spirit-given gift, what is my charisma, so that I can become a more formidable part of Sandy Ridge Baptist Church so that I can serve my brothers and sisters in my small group, in my deacon group, in my prayer group, in my home study, so that I can become what God wants me to be, filled with joy, serving in my gift, so that Christ can be glorified, the one who covered all of our sins with his love. Thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we'll start our business meeting in seven minutes. Seven minutes. Please retrieve your children, and they will come to you in here, or they need to be with you in here.